talking about Chiron and the discussion that's ensued, uh, along with what you know I've gotten as feedback from some other people, um, has uh, interested me in the idea, something that actually has been buzzing around in my head for a very long time, as long as I can remember, actually. A uh, question that arises in a lot of cases with people who are suffering from a dep uh, depressive episode or a lengthy depression. Mine lasted a couple of years. Um, is life worth living? <laughs> well, I'm getting close to something approaching a compatibilist position. Um, Choran certainly helped a lot in the interactions I had with people who seem to be sympathetic with what he says and want to make sure that he's heard correctly, or as they see it, heard correctly. Um, the final bit was, you know, the final interesting part was that he, the, the insistence that he's not preaching, he's simply explaining what his point of view is. Um, <clears throat> now, the interesting thing is, I've always wanted to debate this, but not so much to find out or to sort of see if my position, which is life-affirming, um, not so much to see if I can impose that on somebody else or use my views to refute somebody else's or whatever, but to argue the both cases as exhaustively as is possible and see if either of them is right or if both of them are wrong or both are right in their own way. It's kind of a blind man and the elephant type thing. I think, unfortunately, that um, it's been uh, nothing more than an, exper an, an uh, experiment in Anakantavada, looking at the other person's point of view, in as much as that is possible, um, and understanding just how little information we have to go on either way. Um, as I say, this issue has been with me for a long time, and it actually predated my depression. Um, my interest in Indian philosophy uh, fascinated me with that dichotomy in Indian or Eastern philosophy in general. Roughly speaking, there's the life deniers who are essentially the, probably the majority, at least in terms of official positions. Like if you ask a Buddhist or a Jain or you know, a Hindu who thinks of him or herself as you know, someone who wants to follow their own faith the way that they understand it, generally the idea is that the world is not worth bothering much with. Um, there are always exceptions, of course. <laughs> um, when you look at tantric Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism even. Uh, yeah, Tantric Jainism, that's bizarre, because Tantra is almost inherently life-affirming. Um, but when you see that, you know, the general thrust of Eastern thinking, it's generally life-denying. One could say the same thing about Western thinking. Um, Christianity, is it a life-affirming or a life-denying? It tells you to go forth and multiply, but it also tells you that all that this earth really is, is a place to be evaluated as a human being um, to determine where you're going to go after you snuff it. All right, that's nice. But, you know, again, I would say that that's a life-denying point of view. The same thing with, you know, most of the Judeo-Christian ones. I, I tend to see Ju Judaism as more life-affirming than life-denying, but there's elements of that there as well. Um, but again, in tandem with this, there's always, you know, there's always the sort of left-handed view of things. You know, I'm using, I guess, a Western uh, occult sort of term, left-handed. Um, you know, Satanism and all this kind of thing that tells you to indulge in all the goodies, you know, all the things you're not supposed to indulge in. Um, that's a caricature of occultism, I guess, but, you know, Satanism. Um, but in India, the, the split is apparently or ostensibly very strong between Tantra and the rest of Orthodox Hinduism or Buddhism and Jainism to the point where most Indian people, when you say the word Tantra, they just say uh, not respectable drugs, sex, you know um, 
you know, when you when you're following tantra as a discipline in and of itself. But they will also say though that there's nothing there's no imperative to be a life denier or a life affirmer. The tantrics they do their own weird things. You know, they get the tantrics get extreme sometimes. If you've ever heard of the agoris, I'll see if I can leave a link below to them. They're they're tantrics. Um, but the thing is, this dichotomy between life affirmation and life denial in Eastern thinking is more apparent, if you ask me, than real. Uh, for example, if you study the way that the Buddhists in Southeast Asia generally live, and I would assume that this is true throughout the Buddhistic world. Um, it's they're more concerned about improving their position for the next life <laughs> than they are in terms of escaping life in and of itself. Um, you know the, the Buddhists of today's world are just as concerned about you know getting doing well in life as anyone else is. And a lot of their life denial is strangely life affirming because they, you know, they have this idea that they're going to be reborn after this life, so they want to have a good life. So they want to build up brownie points. Uh, in Thailand, it gets pretty blatant. Um, you want to build up brownie points or merit, as they call it, uh, that will push you towards nirvana eventually, but it'll also improve your next life. You wonder if these people really sit down and think about what nirvana means in the same way. Do you think that a Christian really sits down and troubles himself what really happens after I die? Even though he might be ostensibly more interested in what's going on, you know, after he dies than during his life. But, you know, as Boccaccio says, you know, we, uh, we, uh, we all say that, um, we all know that we're going to die, but we act as though we were going to live forever. Um, that's, you know, human nature, I guess, and life denial or life affirmation be darned, it's, uh, we are what we are. Um, so yeah, a, a, like if you look at the tantras or the, the, the sort of live in the now type thinking or practices in India, the strange thing is they're just as convinced by the idea of sanatana dharma uh, as anyone else is, the eternal law that's karma, samsara, and re reincarnation, um, which means that eventually uh, we'll all end up out of here in some sort of, I don't know, monistic sort of perfect existence or non-existence or whatever. Um, so they're aware of this, but they're just saying, for now, we're here, we're fascinated by being here. We want to understand what the wheel of existence is, what the phenomenal universe actually is. And the more questions we ask, the more questions that arise. And this kind of takes on a, a momentum all of its own. It's, you know, it's self-feeding curiosity, which I think I've come across in a couple of other people. I believe my name is like that. I believe that uh, Matthew Shute is like that and Liber Module is like that. Um, it's, you know, and, and others, I'm sorry, I'm not leaving anyone, <laughs> you know, I, I generally avoid this kind of name dropping because I don't want to, you know, but it, it looks that way. I'm reading these people or, you know, in, in as much as I'm capable of that. And I, it looks to me as though, you know, that's curiosity seems to be the dominant, um, impetus behind their thinking. What's going on? What's over the next hill? Whatever. Whereas other people say, what's over the other hill is exactly what's on this side of things. And, you know, there's nothing more to learn. There's nothing more to, you know, examine. Whereas, you know, the, the life-affirming type or the tantric type understands that curiosity is just as self-perpetuating and even amplifying as death is inevitable. The dissolution of everything is just as inevitable and just as uh, self-fulfilling as is the multiplication of curiosity, the geometric increase in curiosity. Um, I think it's true to say in my case, I have a greater sense of wonder now, as, in as much as I remember this, than I did as a kid. The world seems more fascinating and more, uh, I don't know, multifaceted than I, I ever conceived it was possible, and it gets more fascinating and weird as I get older. Um, now, that's one way in which I guess I would sort of compare and contrast, sort of doing a, 
uh, I don't know, Nietzsche Schopenhauer view of things um, and try and integrate the two into some sort of all encompassing unity. Uh, that's been done as well. As I say, the Buddhists and the Hindus, even though they say they're life deniers, and the Jains certainly are, they tend to set that part of their belief aside when it comes to day to day life. Um, and, you know, or even just their view of their own particular life that they're living. Uh, yeah, eventually I'll be, you know, in, uh, I'll, I'll be one with Atman and Brahman and all that kind of thing. But while I'm here, that chocolate bar that I, that's sitting there on my desk tastes, you know, looks really tempting to me. And the, that woman over there has got nice hips, etc., etc. You know, it's just, there's, uh, not just temptations, but actual desires to experience certain things. Like I want to meditate my way into a higher state of consciousness or something like that. That's Tantra. Um, the, these things are an end in themselves, which I think the life denier sort of, I don't know, the, the way that the mind is put together, they have trouble seeing it that way. Um, whereas the life affirmer has trouble seeing the life deniers point of view and these I, I shouldn't say affirming and denying I'm just sort of using the general terms and if anyone wants to correct me on that go ahead but the the life affirmer will see life denier as depressing and negative and 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 trying to destroy all the nice things not in terms of for everyone else's consumption but they're destroying all the good things that they themselves could be enjoying but you know you you, you listen to what mystic of the sands has to say and and his interpretation of Chiron and he's saying no it's not that at all we have just sort of said, all right, it was fun while we were here. Thank you. But enough. You know, I can relate to that. Um, and the interesting thing is in the case of, say, um, the Eastern way of looking at things, or in Christianity, I guess, um, most, say, for example, Hindus believe that Tantra is disreputable, um, a bit weird and crazy and strange. You know, you... Um, study yantras and chant strange mantras and all this kind of thing, which you know, a lot of Hindus who are not tantrics do. But the, the tantric rites and rituals and practices are particularly weird, I would say, um, to most Hindus. Um, and yet tantric imagery, tantric practices, and tantric ideas suffuse the entirety of popular Hinduism, popular uh, Buddhism, and popular Jainism even. You know, the Shiva's always seen with his lingam. Um, Kali is a an important goddess. Uh, you see pictures of Vishnu with the serpents coming up over his head. Uh, this is all tantric imagery. Uh, the Nagas that you see in Buddhism. Um, Mahavira even is often seen with a bunch of cobras coming over the top of his head. That's tantric Jainism. Um, even though these people might not be aware of it, all this imagery is tantra. <laughs> Um, and by the same token, tantrics uh, are just as likely to get caught up in the ecstatic singing of bhajans or chanting of mantras and, and large ceremonies that look an awful lot like just plain old worship as any, as any sort of um, more orthodox kind of Hindu is, or Buddhist or anybody. Uh, I think that in India, they sort of it's it's a non-solved point, but the two sides bleed into each other so much that I think that the whole issue is not so much not resolved as it's generally seen as perhaps something of a false dichotomy. Everybody is in a sort of a continuum of life denial versus life affirmation. Uh, for example, I um, I, I do certain kind of lame tantric practices like meditation and mantras and um, yoga. Okay, that's the extent of it. Um, but by the same token, I will sometimes say, I wonder what it's going to be like when we're all in a state of, or when the universe is in a state of pure entropy, <laughs> where heat and energy have been dissipated uh, evenly throughout the cosmos. What's that? Now what? This fascinates me. Now that's not a very tantric idea, except for the idea of saying this is what awaits us, so might as well enjoy ourselves while we're here. Because there's, you know, there's an element of that in tantra as well. Um, but I think that I've, 
at least in terms of my view of the whole thing, I've come to something of a compatibilist position uh, in that I don't see it now as an either-or kind of thing. And again, that was a debate I've been wanting to have for a very long time with some anti-nabalists or non-life-affirming types or whatever you want to call that in a, in, a, in, a, in a respectful way that I could actually get to the bottom of what they thought and what their points of view were. Um, my first introduction to it was, you know, of course, with the more <clears throat> headline stealing types on YouTube. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are the quiet voices of reason and, and, and you know, I would say patience uh, out there. Um, you know, Mystic of the Sands and a few of the other people are very patient. Um, and persistent in putting their case forward and not getting worked up when, when they're misunderstood or even misrepresented. I try to be that way, but I think that they're a little bit better than I am. And I try to be that way not because I'm a nice guy, but because I want to actually stick to the point. Um, I don't want to get derailed by stupid irrelevancies, which, you know, as defined by me, that I think are stupid irrelevancies. So maybe, you know, my wife thinks that what I do on the Internet here is a stupid irrelevancy. So... <laughs> all in the eye of the beholder. So it looks as though there is there is some sort of compatibilism that can sort of take place there between the two. Um, we are all on a continuum. People just, you know, say, why don't antinatalists kill themselves or whatever? Um, because you're missing the point when you say that. And it's the same thing. Why do Why would a life affirmer cleave to something that they know is temporary? Well, they've got a different view of time. They have a different view of experience. They have a different view of... Um, ontology itself, what being is, you know, it's, um, they're almost like, I, the way I look at it, it's almost like Pantahrai is, is more of a, of a wonderful thing to think about. The kaleidoscope will never stop generating new things for me to see, and they, you know, in order to make room for them, we have to destroy the old things. Uh, to some people, that's horrific. To some people, that's wonderful. Is it a question of one side is right or one side is wrong? I don't think so. It's just, we all have reasons. We're all the blind men and the elephant, and we have reasons for believing that the elephant is one way, and other people have reasons for it being another, being another way. As I say, this has turned into just another gigantic exercise for me in Anakanta Vada. Um, and when I say that I'm on a general continuum a life affirmer, you know, it's nothing to do with the fact that I have a son or anything. It's just that the world suits me. I remember um, one of the most catchy lines I ever heard was from George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia, where he was shot through the throat um, during the Spanish Civil War, and he said he felt almost no animosity towards the fellow who'd shot him. Uh, he was standing um, on a parapet watching, uh, and he just noticed it was a particularly lovely morning, so he stuck his head up above the parapet to see the sunrise on the flowers that had bloomed in no man's land, and the predictable thing happened. A fascist sniper saw him and shot him. <laughs> um, and he said, even as I you know, felt my head hitting the wooden framework of the trench, as I fell down, I noted, wow, that was a good shot. <laughs> he said the main thing that he uh, that he felt was, was a profound reluctance to leave this world because he said after all is said and done and this is the 1930s and he's fighting in a civil war against the rise of fascism in Europe he said after all, all is said and done this world suits me <laughs> incredibly well um, I can relate to that um, like me or hate me that is a fact the world suits me I don't, it's not that um, I think it's a wonderful place or anything. It works for me. And there are plenty of other people out there who seem to think this way, and other people think it doesn't suit them. We may not be able to resolve that situation, but I think that we're able to, as I say, a continuum is certainly a useful tool to put into place to sort of say, okay, um, not everybody is acting in the world, but not all these people are antinatalists, and not everybody is actually... Um, withdrawing from the world, but not all of these people are life affirmers. Um, I would say that we all sort of just sit on that continuum. Um, 
and it's a fascinating thing. And, and again, this continuum is simply one of the more fascinating aspects of this plane of existence that I've found myself in. I like it. <laughs> um, Charan, I guess, I would assume, doesn't like it in the same way that I do. But he doesn't seem to, or at least the way that I hear, see him being interpreted, he doesn't seem to hate it in an absolute way that in which there's a moral imperative for other people to, to follow what he has to say. And for that, I respect the guy. I like him. Uh, but again, I, I'm being heavily influenced by people whose respect I, you know, who, who, people who have earned my respect. So I don't know. Maybe I'm misreading. But, you know, that's always the risk when you read what somebody else has to say, isn't it? So I don't know. I'm not really ending the subject, but it seems to, we seem to have come to some sort of resolution, at least. Um, so that's, you know, sir, I won't say that that's my final views on it because it's it's a, f a subject that obsesses me, in case you haven't noticed. Um, and just one other little thing. Um, somebody out there in YouTube land has created a profile with my picture on it using my name and is posting things. Um, nothing I can do about that. I'm not going to get all worked up about it. I haven't even... Um, send any emails off to YouTube. Uh, I don't know, maybe I should. But, you know, just if you come across anything that's particularly, seems to be out of character with all my other comments, that's probably what it is. But again, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm going to get misrepresented. Somebody's going to put comments on there that people will attribute to me. Oh well, que sera, sera I guess, eh? <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, it's... Um, it's not something that really is going to occupy me a lot, but I thought I'd make sure that people were aware of that. <laughs>